Thanks for joining us here on 9 News Plus. I'm here with 9 News anchor, host of Next with Kyle Clark. It is Kyle Clark. <laughs> um, Kyle, just want to have you on here to discuss for a few minutes your interesting interview with GOP gubernatorial candidate Greg Lopez yeah. um, last week. Uh, we'll get into some of those clips. We'll actually play this in full here in the next few minutes. But before anything else, I just kind of want to get your top line takeaways from, again, what was an interesting interview. We'll explain why in just a few minutes. Sure. So Greg Lopez is one of two Republican candidates for governor. Lopez and Heidi Ganahl are on the primary ballot coming up. Lopez has run for governor before. He's run for senator before. He used to be Parker mayor like 25 years ago. So he's an experienced political hand. And he is decidedly the underdog in the race for governor for the Republican nomination. But he has the top line on the ballot because he went through the assembly process first. He hmm. outpolled uh, Ganahl at the state assembly. That's where you've got the real hardcore fight and righties. And Ganahl petitioned onto the ballot. She also went the assembly route, so she's on there. But his name will appear first. Her name will appear second. But he's the underdog, and he knows it. Uh, and he was willing to come in and take our questions, which so far is something that Ganahl has not been willing to do. And he came in, no restrictions on the interview, talk about anything that you want. And he said some pretty interesting things to the point that the interview ended up getting some national attention because of what he said about uh, banning abortion, what he said about stopping collection of sales tax, and how if you cut education funding, teachers would have to be more creative. And uh, then he issued a, let's say, less than convincing denial of the fact that he made homophobic comments about the governor's husband. And it was the first time that I had seen where he had been called to account for some of the things that he had said in that respect. You said the other day, I want to read the quote exactly so I don't misquote you. You said that it's time Colorado had a real first lady again. Why choose to introduce homophobia into the race for governor? It's interesting that you would even mention that word because I didn't use it. I don't know how you connected my words to that sentiment. And that's the problem, I think, a lot with our society. What did you mean by have a real first lady Look, again? I love my wife. We've been married 34 years. You know, the first lady is going to work very hard on the issues that pertain to women and children. She's going to be a strong voice, a strong advocate for our kids and women's issues. That's what I meant about it. You know, for people to twist my words, I find it very interesting that in society today, they're always looking to figure out how to make people look like something that they're not. I think that there's a chance that you think that, that I and the folks watching are dumber than we are. Because I think everybody knew what you were saying, and the crowd that clapped for you knew what you were saying. And I'm asking you, why introduce that into the race? You've got plenty of other critiques of the no. governor other than the fact that he's a gay man. Why do that? I didn't. See, here's the thing, right? I'm talking about my wife. I'm talking about the first lady, okay? Now, here's the thing. You look at the titles, first lady, first gentleman. These are just titles, okay? I'm a man married to a female. She would be the first lady. Why is it that people want to twist that? Why would you try to mislead the audience on what it is that I said? I don't even think you can keep a straight face as you say that. Would you have an issue with Heidi Ganahl's husband being the first gentleman? No. So it's just the gay guy? No. You, you're not understanding the, the system. Okay. Right? If you look at it, right? First husband, I mean, the first gentleman, right? And the governor being a female. That's the title. Let me ask you something. If I wasn't married and I had a girlfriend, you're welcome to invite me on your show anytime. No, 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 this is, this is my show where I invite you on and ask you no, questions. No, but I, I'm trying so, to get So again, you're saying clarity. When, you, when you made this comment about Colorado needing a real first lady, this is simply about you want yes. a female in that role as opposed to a male. I'm talking about having a female that's going to focus on women issues and children's issues. That's what I'm talking sure. about. Sure. And if your primary opponent, Heidi Ganahl, is elected, why shouldn't her husband, as first gentleman, be able to focus on whatever he chooses? I'm not saying he can't. I'm talking about my wife. I'm talking about my first lady. Well, I would say, yeah, you mentioned a bunch of those different things. I would yep. say the reason that I saw the national attention was kind of given to this was Lopez's answer specifically to your question about whether or not his 1993 domestic violence arrest should affect his credibility, specifically regarding abortion. We'll play the clip for you now. You have said in, specifically on this issue that you are pro-life without exceptions for rape and incest and life or health of the mother. Additionally, in 1993, you were arrested for violently assaulting your then pregnant wife. Some people might see those two things at odds, but they both involve you exerting control over a woman's body. Is that what Coloradans want from their governor? Well, first of all, it wasn't a violent situation. If you let, you know, if you go back and you look- You were arrested for assault. We were both arrested for assault, mm -hmm. both of us. 
and okay. one of you was pregnant. So again, the question so is, the, do Coloradans want somebody who has a history both in word and in physical let me tell you this, Kyle. of controlling the bodies? Of Here's the thing. There's only been one perfect man that's ever walked this earth, and we nailed him to the cross. I'm not a perfect man. I've made my mistakes, but I've learned from them. And I think most people learn from their mistakes. And I think really that's what people want to hear, is that you learn from your mistakes and you lead by example. And I think the people that I've talked to throughout the state of Colorado, they understand that. You don't see it as an issue of control over women's bodies? No, I do not. Okay, so either the assault on your wife or the fact that I don't understand how you, con you connect those things. Kyle, now that we've seen the clip, what are your thoughts looking back on that answer and um, kind of how he answered it as well? Sure. I think that's one of those questions where I expected him to challenge the premise of the question, which is completely mm -hmm. fair, because the premise of the question was, both in this old incident, which was a long time ago, and in your current views, uh, no exceptions for rape, incest, life or health of the mother, both of those things involve control over women's bodies. And at the very end of his answer, he said, I don't understand how you can connect those. And I respect his right to believe that. I think a lot of people who saw the interview say, I do see how those two things are connected. Uh, but he doesn't see either of those as an issue of control over women's bodies. And at the end of the day, voters will decide whether or not they agree with him. And, and speaking of voters deciding whether or not to agree with him, you, you mentioned this at the start, is that um, I, I don't know if it's the right way to say that he deserves credit for going ahead and taking questions. How, how would you well, characterize sure he does. it? Does he? Okay. Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, I mean, we're increasingly in a political environment where there are some folks running for elected office or in elected office that think that they don't have to answer mm -hmm. to the public or that they only need to do it in their safe spaces where they know that interviews, interviewers will only ask them friendly questions, won't ask follow-ups, won't press them on things. And Greg Lopez, who I've known in Colorado politics for close to 10 years, has never been that person. We can have a contentious back and forth exchange. He doesn't personalize it. He understands that it's what he's signing up for. It's what I've signed up for in my job. And both of us are just there doing our jobs. He's there answering questions. I'm there asking questions. And he doesn't take it personally. There seems to be an increasing number of folks in politics who think that they want to be elevated to very hard jobs where they will face difficult questions daily, and the way to get there is to avoid all difficult <laughs> questions. Uh, and I, I have a difference of opinion. I think that answering difficult questions is a great way to show people that you can handle difficult questions. I mean, it's a public service, is it not? I mean, if you are going out there and you're making your case to the public and saying, I should be governor of Colorado, and again, admitting, admittedly adding some subjectivity to this, but if you're going out there and saying, I wanna be your governor, here's my flaws, here's my, uh, you know, my, my pros, mm -hmm. um, again, there's credit to be said for that. And um, his GOP uh, counterpart at this point, Heidi Gonnell, has not taken your questions yet. Correct. She did do a brief interview with Marshall Zellinger when she announced, okay. um, and would encourage folks to uh, to go back and watch that. They had a very interesting exchange where he struggled to uh, elucidate whether or not she believes the 2020 election was stolen. Uh, and since that time, she has not been willing to take any questions from us. The goal in these extended sit-down interviews, I think the one with Greg Lopez was close to 20 minutes. Even in 20 minutes, you can't get close to all the topics that you want to discuss. But the hope is that in 20 minutes, you get a feel for the woman or the man, and you get a feel for how their mind works and how they process challenges and what their worldview is and how that would apply to Colorado. It would be wonderful to be able to sit down with all the candidates for governor and for Senate. We've invited them all uh, to have those extended conversations so that people can get an idea of what they think on a number of different issues. So I, I do think credit is due to Mr. Lopez for the fact that he's always willing to come in, always willing to answer the questions, and even when, when pressed, he doesn't leave in a huff, he doesn't insult, uh, he has a back and forth. His views, our questions, that's the way it should work. And speaking of that, uh, I guess the final big um, issue, I would say, I mean, there were a couple of them, you mentioned um, some of the relations to the, uh, the, the homophobic comments that he made, but mm -hmm. also, um, at least from my point of view, watching the interview in full was Lopez's answer on reducing the state budget by 30%. Was pretty striking. I know you alluded to this at the start here, but he talks about, for example, fixing teacher performance by slashing the budget and encouraging teachers to be more creative. Education is obviously another big driver of the state budget, given our requirements on education spending. Do you see 30% of the education budget being subject to fraud, waste, and abuse? Well, when you have 60% of our fourth graders not being able to read at the fourth grade level, 
and 50% not being able to do math. That's an outcome. That's not fraud, waste, or abuse. Well, the money is to be, they're supposed to be used to teach an education. And so if they're not teaching that mission, then what would you call it? How does cutting their budget through lowering sales tax intake provide a better result in the end? By allowing them to be creative, the teachers, right? By allowing them and making sure that the school unions are not involved in the classroom. That's the biggest challenge. I talk to a lot of teachers. We've got some great teachers out there. And they tell me, you know, I really wish I could teach without the student, without the teachers union getting in my way. Um, I've got to say, that's a pretty striking, weird answer. Now, is it not? Uh, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, he said, uh, the way that you improve educational outcomes is by taking money away from teachers. So they have to scramble to be creative. Um, I mean, I've certainly heard an argument before for cutting education spending. I don't know that I've ever heard any politician say before, well, the way to improve student outcomes is less money in the education system forces teachers to be more creative. That was a situation where I had never heard him say that before. So this wasn't like I wanted to question him about this. I had actually never heard him talk about suspending the state collection of sales tax before. I tried to listen to a number of his interviews, his public speeches. That had slipped past me. Hmm. I was asking him about how can the governor address inflation, and he says, well, let's stop collecting state sales tax. Of course, Colorado has three big revenue streams. You've got income taxes, property taxes, and sales taxes. He says, I want to stop collecting the state portion of sales taxes, so I asked him, how do you backfill the revenue? I, I get what is a pretty much a, a boilerplate answer from a lot of conservatives, cut waste, fraud, and abuse. And he said, 30% of the budget is waste, fraud, and abuse. That's a hefty total even for the folks who promote this idea of waste, fraud, and abuse being that rampant. So then I asked him to drill down on a couple of areas, first on road funding, then on education. And when he just explicitly said, yeah, uh, you know, the outcomes aren't good. Well, that's not waste, fraud, and abuse. That's a different issue. If Colorado doesn't have good educational outcomes, then how do we improve those educational outcomes? And Mr. Lopez said it came back to the same answer. Take money away from them. Teachers will be more creative. I will say, uh, teachers were pretty creative in their feedback to Mr. Lopez about that answer, which they found somewhat lacking. Any final big takeaways from your interview with Mr. Lopez? The takeaway is you learn interesting things about political candidates when they sit down to do mm. interviews outside of their safe spaces. And a candidate can appear and get the same questions from their same ideological allies over and over and over again or people can come and talk to a wide range of media, get different questions, and some of the questions are going to be very direct, and they're going to be difficult questions. Some of them are going to be direct, but not very difficult. And some of them are just going to be open-ended conversations that take us to interesting places, like how we learned that Greg Lopez wanted to cut education funding to force teachers to be creative. Well, Kyle, thanks so much for joining us here, and appreciate a few minutes of your time. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me on the stream. On the stream. Pleasure <laughs> to have you, Kyle. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, welcome to Greg Lopez, who's one of two Republicans on the primary ballot for a governor. Uh, we have also invited, without success so far, Heidi Ganahl, uh, your primary opponent. Greg Lopez, welcome back to Next. Thank you so much for having me, Kyle. The Supreme Court appears poised to strike down Roe versus Wade. Big picture, what do you make of this moment in American history? You know, I was reading the opinion. And it's interesting because they look at talking about the Constitution, and I truly believe that they're focusing on the Tenth Amendment. They're saying, you know what, this decision needs to go back to the states. The states needs to decide how they want to handle this moral dilemma within their, their respective states. And I think, you know what, I really believe that's what the Constitution is all about. What then should Colorado do? Well, I think Colorado's already made a kind of their decision. If you notice, they passed a bill during the legislature. There was a lot of discussion about that, you know, and how they should move forward. I think right now the legislature has already set the foundation for where Colorado is going to go. As a matter of fact, I think there's people already kind of planning for an influx of new people coming into the state because of what the decision of the Supreme Court may bring. And what do you think about that? You know, I think it's going to be a very challenging time for the state of Colorado and across the nation. Because as you know, abortion's always been one of those moral dilemmas that people struggle with. What is the right thing to do? You know, and so I think we're going to find out what America is truly all about as we have this discussion into the future. What is the right thing for Colorado to do moving forward? Not what's been done, but what you as governor would think would be the right thing to do. You know, I think the best thing to do is listen to the people, right? We need to go out there and talk to the people. You know, I think right now the legislature has made a decision, but I'm not so sure that they really have their hand on the pulse of the people. I think we need to have some real conversation about what this all means. Would you like to see a statewide referendum, a vote on access to abortion? 
You know, I would like to see a statewide conversation. You know, I don't know right now if we should do a referendum or not. I think first we need to have a conversation and make sure that we, the pastors and people, community leaders, stakeholders, that we have a very good, robust conversation before we decide what we're going to do to move forward. And that's what I'm going to be as governor. You know, I want to govern with a steady and measured hand. I think that's what people expect from their governor. Your primary opponent, Heidi Ganahl, says that the recent law passed by Democrats, signed into law by the Democratic governor, putting abortion rights in state law, that that must be undone. Do you agree that that must be undone? Here's my concern with that law, and I do believe that we need to undo it, but here's why. It says that there is no life in the womb of a female, and I think that's wrong. I think we need to acknowledge, I have two children, you have two children. I think we need to acknowledge that life does exist in the womb. And when I read that language, it gives me really pause for concern as to, did we lose our moral compass here in Colorado? And I think that's really the question that people are asking themselves. Two Republicans uh, you know well, Pat Neville and um, uh, Dave Williams, both introduced abortion bans at the state legislature this year. Both were defeated by the Democratic majorities up there. But in a future session, if Republicans held the majority and they brought an abortion ban to you as governor, would you sign it? You know, I think what we would do, right, legislation, if they pass it on both the House and the Senate, depending on the language. You know, it's, it's kind of interesting to try to look into the future. The language of the legislation is what the governor needs to look at. Because, again, the most powerful people in government are not the elected officials, are the bureaucrats on how they interpret the language of the legislative bill. So I would have to read the bill very carefully. But as it pertains to if they passed it, of course, there's something I need to consider to sign. And odds are I would sign it. You would sign a, mm -hmm. an abortion ban? Mm -hmm. Okay. You have said in, specifically on this issue that you are pro-life without exceptions for rape and incest and life or health of the mother. Additionally, in 1993, you were arrested for violently assaulting your then pregnant wife. Some people might see those two things at odds, but they both involve you exerting control over a woman's body. Is that what Coloradans want from their governor? Well, first of all, it wasn't a violent situation. If you let you know, if you go back and you look, were arrested for assault. We were both arrested for assault, mm -hmm. both of us. And okay. one of you was pregnant. So again, the question so is: the, Do Coloradans want somebody who has a history, both in word and in physical let me tell you this, Kyle. of controlling the bodies? Of Here's the thing: There's only been one perfect man that's ever walked this earth, and we nailed him to the cross. I'm not a perfect man. I've made my mistakes, but I've learned from them. And I think most people learn from their mistakes. And I think really that's what people want to hear is that you learn from your mistakes and you lead by example. And I think the people that I've talked to throughout the state of Colorado, they understand that. You don't see it as an issue of control over women's bodies? No, I do not. Okay, so either the assault on your wife or the fact that I don't understand how you, con you connect those things. Okay. Republicans nationwide have been able to make some inroads with Latinos, most recently in Virginia. Mm -hmm. I know that that's been a focus of your campaigns. Is that something that you think that you alone can accomplish, or could any Republican candidate for governor make inroads in minority communities? Well, I can tell you this. I'm one of them. I understand their culture. I understand how they think. They're conservatives. They truly believe in family. They believe in hard work. They believe in making sure their children have a good education. And they don't like government to interfere in their lives. I know that community. I've been in it for the last 20 some odd years. As the president of the Denver Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, I truly understand the importance of small business and how they're looking at society. I think it really comes down to who can actually connect with all voters, not just the Latino community, but the black community, you know, the hardworking men and women in small business. I think people are looking for that type of governor. And, and we've seen Republicans have some success with that across the country uh, lately. So my question is, is that something that you think that you alone in this governor's race can deliver or could both you or Heidi make similar inroads, you think? I think I'm the only one that can actually make inroads into those communities. And why is that? Because I'm one of them. Look, human nature always looks for people that we have something in common. I'm bilingual. I understand. I'll be at the Cinco de Mayo Festival. I'll be there with them. And this is what people want. They want a governor that they feel truly understands their challenges. What do you think is within the control of the governor when it comes to inflation? Well, you know, when you look at inflation, right, we need to look at what are some of the legislation that's being passed. 
Here we have the ability to do more gas and oil, do our own gasoline. But we really what you need to do is have a governor that's outspoken about this, that's talking about it. It's interesting to me that sometimes the legislation, and maybe it's because we're in an election cycle, right? He's pretty crafty on how he changes his message. And so I think that there is a lot of things that the governor can do. For example, not charge sales tax to the small business communities. Allow the small business and consumers to keep more of their money. Because right now, you know, it seems like they're struggling on fi figuring out how much they're going to spend of all this money that they've received from the federal government. So let's not continue to charge a sales tax to the small business owners. Let's explore that. So you'd be talking about a permanent suspension, a moratorium for some amount of time, and then how would you make up the revenue for all the things that sales tax fund? We don't need to make up any of those revenue. Look, 30% of the, of the budget is uh, fraud, waste, and abuse. You know that, and I know that. You know, a lot of these programs aren't moving the, ne the needle. They're not really helping the lives of people. The quality of life of people here in the state of Colorado is not getting better. You talk to them and you ask them, is your quality of life better today than it was four years ago? And the answer is no, it's not. So there's fraud, waste, and abuse in the state budget, and we don't need to replace that. We need to make sure we use the money correctly. So let's talk about some of the big drivers of the state budget. You think that 30% of the money spent on infrastructure around the state is fraud, waste, and abuse? There's a lot of, yes. In there, in there. Yeah. You okay. know, there's, you may not know this, but there was a $30 million expenditure that CDOT had to make because they delayed in making a decision on the interchange of C-470 and I-25. When you look at some of the lack of really being able to properly govern and properly run projects, you see that fraud, waste, and abuse. And I guess you categorize that as waste. I, education is obviously another big driver of the state budget, given our requirements on education spending. Do you see 30% of the education budget being subject to fraud, waste, and abuse? Well, when you have 60% of our fourth graders not being able to read at the fourth grade level and 50% not being able to do math. That's an outcome. That's not fraud, waste, or abuse. Well, the money is to be, they're supposed to be used to teach an education. And so if they're not teaching that mission, then what would you call it? How does cutting their budget through lowering sales tax intake provide a better result in the end? By allowing them to be creative, the teachers, right? By allowing them and making sure that the school unions are not involved in the classroom. That's the biggest challenge. I talk to a lot of teachers. We've got some great teachers out there. And they tell me, you know, I really wish I could teach without the student, without the teachers union getting in my way. Which districts have you heard that from? You know, I've heard them from all of them. You know, Douglas County, Adams, you know, uh, Jefferson. You talk to any teacher and they'll tell you that there's a concern about the teachers union. Yeah. Would love to explore the Douglas County issue a bit more, seeing that their uh, union doesn't have collective bargaining rights, doesn't have a, a formal role in the district. But you said that you hear from teachers who believe that the union is interfering with their classroom activities yes. in Dugco. How specifically? Well, again, right, it's that whisper campaign. You and I know this, right? There's always influence coming from the top. And that influence oftentimes undermines the teaching capabilities of the teachers. So we need to have those discussions. And look, and we, we have to look at it in its entirety, all 64 counties. You know, too many times people focus on the big chunks and they forget that we all matter in the state of Colorado. And so when you look at rural Colorado and you look at the urban corridor, as governor, I'm gonna bring them together because we cannot continue to be divided. That's not good for our state. One thing that is touching every county in Colorado is the fentanyl epidemic right now. What action could the state be taking that it is not taking to address fentanyl deaths? Well, the first thing they should never should have done is increase the amount of fentanyl that you could carry up to four ounces. You know, right now they, they even did one ounce. They need to do away with that. Look, we need to be tough on crime. We need to let people know that we're not going to tolerate that type of drug walking in our streets. It's destroying the community fabric. It's destroying our children. We're losing people every single day because of that. We cannot ignore that. We must be strong and we must be able and willing to hold people accountable for their behavior. And as governor, I want to make sure that people understand, I'm not going to tolerate that. We're going to work together with sheriffs. We're going to work together with the chiefs of the police and the counties and the cities to see what we can do to send a strong message that if you're selling this, we're going to hold you accountable if we catch you. 
So you're referring to uh, the bill in what was a 2013, the bipartisan bill that reduced the penalties for some amount. Of I believe it's 2017. 20, uh, you're correct. You're right. correct. It's the 2017 bill uh, sponsored by, among other folks, I believe Republican State Senator John Cook, who used to be the sheriff up in Well County. Um, so it seems like there's some disagreement in terms of law enforcement on, on what works. What have you heard from outside law enforcement about what works and what doesn't work on fentanyl? We've certainly heard from law enforcement. What do you hear from outside that circle? You no, know, what I'm hearing is, what is the root cause? Why are people trying to go into this self-medication? Is it because society has turned their backs on them? Is it because the faith-based community is no longer connecting with them? Is it because the government is interfering? We really need to look at what is causing people to go to those extremes. And I think we haven't had those conversations. I think it's important that we do have them so that we can move forward and truly make a change. So we have seen spikes in fentanyl deaths in states that have loosened restrictions like Colorado and in other states that haven't changed restrictions. What evidence have you seen that a so-called tough on crime approach reduces drug use? You know, it's pretty clear. You know, you have more officers out in the street. The message gets out that, you know what, we're not going to tolerate this, and it'll go down. Look what's, the opposite is true. You think that addicts will choose not to use if there's cops on the streets? If there's not, if there's not the ability to buy it on the streets as, as easily as it is today. Look at the opposite effect that we have. When we tell people that you can steal a car and only get a, a ticket, a citation, what happened to our car thefts? They've went through the ceiling. So you have to look at these types of things from both sides of the equation. And I think that's what's lacking right now at the governor's office and at the legislature, is that we're not having good conversation because we don't have enough from both parties where they're trying to learn and make sure that we do the right thing for the state of Colorado. So I mean, there is a bipartisan conversation happening at the Capitol. There just aren't a lot of Republicans who have been elected to be part of that conversation. Well, I can tell you this. Some people will call it a conversation. Other people will say, you know, they just kind of acknowledge that. Look, when I go and testify, if you've ever gone and testify in front of a bill, you know they're not paying attention. They're just sitting there. You know, they're not even acknowledging. They don't even look at you in the face when you're testifying. Both sides don't look at you in the face. I think for the most part, those that have already made their decisions aren't looking at you. So you can tell. You can tell who has already made their minds up because they're not looking at the testimony and they're not, they're not looking at the individuals. Those that truly are still pondering, they listen and they look in the people's eyes to make sure that they fully understand what they're trying to articulate in those two minutes. Let's talk about how Colorado selects its candidates. You've called for an end to mail-in voting, saying that Colorado should stand in line to vote again. Would that make it easier for Republicans to win? No, it's not about making it easier to win. It's about making sure people feel that they're providing their civic duty, that they're standing in line because they are proud Americans. And a lot of people fought for the right to stand in line. You know, we stand in line for concerts. We stand in line for baseball games and football games. Why can't we stand in line to vote? You know, we don't ask people to do this every week. We ask them to do it every two years. You know, and I remember you used to be able to get that little sticker that said, I voted. You know, and we need to make sure that people feel that they are part of a true process. That's what I'm talking about. Over the last decade, when you've had the choice to stand in line to vote in person or vote by mail, you've chosen to vote by mail. Why? I choose to do both. You know, it all depends on, again, right? It comes through the mail. You know, I will either deliver it or drop it off, just like that process. So, you know, it's not... But you're calling for that, that option to be taken away from Coloradans, and you want folks to stand in line at the, at the polling places. That's what you've said. And I'm just asking you, why do you vote by mail, but you want everybody to stand in line? No, no, no. You're not listening to what I'm saying. I've done both, okay? I believe standing in line is more appropriate, okay? The law says right now we don't necessarily have to go to get it through the mail necessarily to go vote. I've done both. I truly believe that when people are asked to vote and stand in line, I feel that they are more informed. They're more part of the process. As it, when it comes to voting for our elected officials. Do you see it as an undue burden on folks uh, who don't have the disposable time and the ability to go and stand in line for potentially hours at a time like we see in other states versus mailing in their votes the way you do? No, you know what, I don't. Because look, when there's a will, there's a way. You know that and I know that. When people truly want to vote, and the government is not stopping people from voting, you know, if they truly need an uh, absentee ballot, the state says, we'll give you an absentee ballot. So to me, it's, about, it's a matter of if you really want to vote through the mail, you can. But for the most part, I think us standing in line 
sends a real strong message to the next generation and to people to understand this is our civic duty. You just said if you want to vote through the mail, you can, but you've called for the end of mail-in voting. Well, I'm talking about absentee ballots. We've always had absentee ballots. You know that and I know that. So if we go back to where there was polls, you know that there was always absentee ballots. I'm not saying get rid of the absentee ballot. I'm saying that, you know, for the most part, most people should stand in line. Do you want to get rid of no excuse absentee ballots, the idea that everybody gets mailed a ballot? Is that what you're looking yes. to get rid of? Okay, mm -hmm. very good. You said the other day, I want to read the quote exactly so I don't misquote you. You said that it's time Colorado had a real first lady again. Why choose to introduce homophobia into the race for governor? It's interesting that you would even mention that word because I didn't use it. I don't know how you connected my words to that sentiment. And that's the problem, I think, a lot with our society. What did you mean by have a real first lady Look, again? I love my wife. We've been married 34 years. You know, the first lady is going to work very hard on the issues that pertain to women and children. She's going to be a strong voice, a strong advocate for our kids and women's issues. That's what I meant about it. You know, for people to twist my words, I find it very interesting that in society today, they're always looking to figure out how to make people look like something that they're not. I think that there's a chance that you think that, that I and the folks watching are dumber than we are. Because I think everybody knew what you were saying, and the crowd that clapped for you knew what you were saying. And I'm asking you, why introduce that into the race? You've got plenty of other critiques of the no. governor other than the fact that he's a gay man. Why do that? I didn't. See, here's the thing, right? I'm talking about my wife. I'm talking about the first lady, okay? Now, here's the thing. You look at the titles, first lady, first gentleman. These are just titles, okay? I'm a man married to a female. She would be the first lady. Why is it that people want to twist that? Why would you try to mislead the audience on what it is that I said? I don't even think you can keep a straight face as you say that. Would you have an issue with Heidi Ganahl's husband being the first gentleman? No. So it's just the gay guy? No. You, you're not understanding the, the system. Okay. Right? If you look at it, right? First husband, I mean the first gentleman, right? And the governor being a female. That's the title. Let me ask you something. If I wasn't married and I had a girlfriend, you're welcome to invite me on your show anytime. No, 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 this is, this is my show where I invite you on to ask you no, questions. No, no, but I, I'm trying so, to get, So again, you're saying, clarity. When, you, when you made this comment about Colorado needing a real first lady, this is simply about you want yes. a female in that role as opposed to a male. I'm talking about having a female that's going to focus on women issues and children's issues. That's what I'm talking sure. about. Sure. And if your primary opponent, Heidi Ganahl, is elected, why shouldn't her husband, as first gentleman, be able to focus on whatever he chooses? I'm not saying he can't. I'm talking about my wife. I'm talking about my first lady. Gotcha. What's the most important thing that you want to talk about that we haven't brought up? I think the most important thing that I want to talk about is that it's about all of us, not just some of us. We got to stop this div divisiveness. We got to stop this kind of conversation that we're having just, just now. Let's talk about the facts. Let's talk about what's really important for Colorado, because that's what I'm going to do. It's about all of us, not just some of us. And we must be here to make sure that we can make Colorado a state that we can all be proud of. That's what I want to talk about. Very last question for you. Republicans and those unaffiliated voters who choose to participate in your primary have to make a choice. Presumably, they're choosing somebody that they think is best positioned to beat Governor Polis in the general election. Why is that you and not your opponent? I think because, you know what, I have a true governing experience. You know, I come from humble beginnings. I don't come from money. I don't come from a great education. But I do come from a great God. And I just want to do is help people. I want to make sure that everybody has the ability to start from the same starting line. And everybody has the ability to achieve whatever dream they want to achieve without any obstacles in their ways. I think that's what people are looking for in the governor here in Colorado. Greg Lopez, one of two Republicans running for governor in Colorado, the only one so far to accept our invitation to come in and take questions. I appreciate your time and look forward to talking with you again. Same here. Thank you, Kyle.